In a world before ACOG, there was... Hello and welcome to Bloke on the Range and today we're going to be talking about this particular optic sight, the Sight Unit Infantry Trilux suit sight, mounted here as it normally would be on an L1A1 SLR, but it also found its way onto other things as well because it's kind of what they had. Now it's very typically British of its era in that the basic idea behind it is sound, but there's some things that are kind of lacking in the execution. Now, um, basically, uh, from the mid-70s until the end of the SLR era, which uh, well started in the mid-80s and kind of went on a bit longer until the L85, L86 had permeated the system. Um, but it's extremely forward thinking. first appears in the 1975 manual, and we'll look at what that says about it over on the table in a moment. And as the name suggests, it's intended to be a very, very wide issue optic for the infantry. It's not a DMR. There was no concept of a DMR. In fact, the, the DMR concept doesn't come into British thinking until much, 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 much later, uh, particularly with the L129A1, the uh, LMT AR10 DMR. Um, so this is very much thinking-wise ahead of its time. I mean, issuing optical sights on on battle rifles, on infantry rifles, was something the Germans did in World War II, but they didn't do it to any significant degree. Now, what you find is that in archive photos, you don't actually see that many of them in use. For, for, for an item that is supposed to be a very, very wide issue to infantry, it's not that common. And the basic answer behind that is, it's crap. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that's reflected in it. In fact, the scope itself is not crap. The mounting system is utter, utter tonk. And I will go over to the uh, to the table and talk about that now. Okay, so here it is on the rifle. Let us get rid of this rather alley LMG mag. Yes, the springs are strong enough. Yes, they run fine. It's a bit of a myth they don't probably to stop uh, people acquiring them for their own kit. So it mounts on a modified top cover. And let's just quickly go over the features of it. So we have a rubber eye cup here we have a lever that switches between 300 and 500 meters elevation. We have a quick release here. You'll see it is an offset sight. So you've got uh, about an inch or so off of bore axis. Uh, why they did this possibly to give access to this or possibly they did it before, I actually don't know. Um, it does limit the mirage coming off, uh, coming off the very, very light barrel. Um, we have some adjustments and uh, yeah. Now, because this is a bit of a pest on the rifle, I have a spare top cover here and I will just take it off and uh, we'll have more room for maneuver. Okay, so here we are able to look around it. And the first thing you'll notice when you look through it, if I can actually line this up with the camera enough, is the pointer comes down from the top, not the bottom, and that is Correct, it is meant to be like that. Uh, the reasoning behind this is it makes holdovers easier because you're not obscuring the uh, target with the, uh, with the pointer. It means that as the scope rises under recoil like that, you can still see your target in the unobstructed bottom part of the, uh, of, 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 uh, of the lens. Um, but it's a, uh, Yes, nice theory, sort of theory that appeals to people who make decisions and not people who use them. Because normally when you, when you relax to observe, you're going to drop the rifle because it takes less energy. But you can't really do that here because the point is up the top, so you've then got to do it not using the sort of top part of the lens, or you've got to hold the rifle up, or yeah. So uh, let us just see what the 1975 pamphlet says about this. The optic sight is a detachable sight with a magnification of four and is supplied for use with the rifle in the infantry role. It is equipped with an internally illuminated inverted aiming pointer. The sight is designed to improve the night vision capability of the infantryman and in enable him to engage targets at longer ranges than is possible with the naked eye. The amount of this improvement is dependent upon light falling on the target and the target slash background contrast. 
The range at which targets can be engaged effectively when using the sights at the lower sight levels varies from two to three times that of the iron sights. By day, the optic sight assists in the acquisition and engagement of targets with low background contrast and at the effective range of the rifle and is also a useful surveillance aid. The Trilux lamp used in the optic sight contains tritium gas from which no hazard can arise unless a breakage occurs. Blah, 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 blah. So, it is illuminated. This is, uh, this is the, the knob you turn to vary the illumination and you've got a tritium capsule in there and this is just a, a rotating mask that exposes or uh, doesn't expose it so much. Um, now that's all good and well in theory, but as you will see as we dive deeper into this, the practice just from an engineering standpoint uh, is no, never gonna hold up. So, if we take a standard SLR top cover, it's literally just a bit of, bit of pressed steel that slides into rails on the top. This is kind of reinforced with a bracket. Uh, the tabs at the back there are a bit bigger. Um, and you can see the obvious problem here that, that we're mounting the sight on rails that were never designed to hold a sight. And we've got no clamping mechanism or anything there. Um, I think obvious problem is obvious. Now you can make them very tight. You can very much force fit them by bending the, bending the tabs a bit and deforming the rails and giving it a bit of, bit of persuasion. Um, but given the military habits of um, always making sure the rifle is fully clean, that's when you take the top cover off to clean because you need to clean that part of the receiver. Um, as soon as you take this off, the chances of it returning anywhere near zero are limited. Now, I don't think it should have been beyond the wit of man or beast, even for Enfield back in the 70s, to have come up with something like this. Obviously, Picatinny rail wasn't a thing then, but there's various types of this. This is a UTG one. Um, where you've got clamping rails that clamp with screws to the receiver. Obviously this makes it more difficult to take it off for cleaning, but fundamentally this, once it's on and clamped, and if you locked like the screws, this shouldn't be going anywhere. Um, it's not just the Brits that made this, this mistake. The Dutch, uh, with their Kijker Richt Recht, so scope aiming straight, they did the same thing. It just seems to be quite a common, uh, a common way of doing it. G3 is better on this front because it has, it doesn't have an open top receiver and it's got clamping points on the receiver itself. So, back at the plot, the eye relief on this is typically of its era. Let's see if we can even get it on the camera, I doubt it. It's gonna get so close. You can see the problem here. Um, I mean, when I use it, because because I'm a specky twat and wear glasses, I have to take I have to take the uh, the eye cup off. You're meant to press your eye against it, and 308 recoils quite in a quite exciting manner. So, I think the best way to understand this further is if we lift this lever, and we can have a look first at the mount. So. What we've got here is we've got a little V-block on the front that interfaces with that stud, and that is the elevation adjustment there. There's no clicks. Each graduation is about four minutes of angle, roughly. It's already telling you something there. Um, so that sits in that V-block. This, I guess you call it the, uh, the recoil post. This interfaces with a notch there, and that's what takes the recoil. At the back here, we have uh, two camming surfaces, or two, two, two wings, abutment surfaces, and then you've got this double cam here on the scope itself, and that gives you the two, the two ranges. Um, the Israeli ones, which are issued with M16s, apparently is the same cam. Uh, so I saw someone write someone, something somewhere, maybe it was in a direct message. Um, that they'd tested, they'd swapped out the cams. Um, so for the 308, something to NATO on the uh, SLR, it's 300, 500. On the M16, on the Israeli ones, same cam, but it's 250, 450, and meters because we're in the metric era. Here we have the windage adjustment. Again, roughly four mower uh, per mark, and that acts on the notch that interacts, that interfaces with the uh, the recoil pillar 
there. To hold it all in place, it's this one weird serpentine spring, and that bit there. That bit there hooks onto that hook there, and then when we, we clamp it down, I'm so glad I've got this extra one here, because doing this with the rifle in place is a pain, but sometimes you have to... Where are we? Okay, we make sure it's all lined up, and then we push that down, and that is clamped, and everything's just being held by this one spring. Yes. So, there's a fair amount of tension on it, but that's a fairly hefty, hefty sight, and you can see how it's not the most stable arrangement. Uh, when you push into it too much, you could flex it one way or another, you could move the mount, the, the, the top cover with respect to the rifle. It's just generally not that well thought out a system. It's almost as if someone went to a company, like design consultancy, who with no firearms experience sort of explained the forces in play, explained what was going on and said, we need to attach this thing to this thing, do something. Um, yeah. So, anyway, I'm taking this rifle to finish brutality in about two and a half weeks. Um, I'm going to take this to the range and do some shooting with it to, check, to see its return to zero. Um, I can't do it at the moment. It's going to be split into a separate video. Um, but my experience with these has been that the rifle group's worse than with the iron sights, as a general rule. And also the zero will shift suddenly. It doesn't come back to zero when you take it off, but we'll do a bit of testing. We'll have a nerdy range testing video on that. Um, what I think I'm likely to do is take something a bit more modern. This is a primary arms SLX three times micro prism, uh, which is basically doing what this was trying to do. Um, and I'll mount it, not on this high riser, but I'll mount it on a clamp on rail, whether this one or another one I've got coming. Um, and this will, I, th I think that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate concession to function because I want to, I'd like to see what the SLR can do with an optic as it was intended to be, not how it was in reality. Because I mean, in a transit case, I'm not expecting this to keep zero while being dragged down to the train station and on, on trains and on planes and in automobiles and so on and so forth. So I don't have a lot of confidence in it. But uh, the interesting difference in uh, 45 years of optics design is that we've got a much bigger eye box on prismic, prismatic optics these days. This is much better. This is really, really, really short and really, really, really crap. But as I said, it was very, very forward thinking at the time. Um, apparently, according to the old and bold, the shortage item was actually the, the top covers. Strangely enough, they don't seem to have made as many top covers as they did sites, or at least the units didn't get them. Uh, but I don't think there was any love lost on them. That doesn't seem to have been uh, that doesn't seem to have been a thing really. That uh, the, 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 the the soldiers issued with these were like, oh my god, I have to have one. It's brilliant. Plus, it's heavy. So there you go. As you heard over at the table, I'm taking this rifle to finish brutality, but I'm unlikely to take this optic with me. I'm likely to do uh, to take the primary arms three times micro prism as what this was trying to achieve, but sucked out. So um, there you go. I hope that was at least vaguely interesting. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Please consider supporting us on Player or uh, Patreon, which are the two crowdfunding sources we use. And uh, onwards and upwards. See you again sometime. Bye.